All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Really excited that, uh, that everyone's here. So this is the second in IA's Best of the Internet event series. As the name suggests, we're here to talk about the best of the internet and the one law that makes that all possible, which is Section 30 of the Communications Decency, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Um, as our panelists might suggest, we're not, this isn't a policy conversation, but I do want to take just a quick two minutes to talk about uh, what CDA 230 is and why it enables sort of all of what we're about to talk about. So Section 230 does two really important things. First, it says that online platforms, and that's platforms of all sizes, whether it's, say, a local news site with a comment section to an online marketplace like eBay to uh, a social media site like Instagram, uh, they are not considered the speakers of the content that users are posting on their sites. Um, and secondly, CDA 230 says that those platforms are allowed to enforce a code of conduct that says you, know, you can't say hateful things, you can't say threatening things, and you don't face liability for enforcing that code of conduct. Um, and it's really hard to overstate just how important that law has been to the creation of the modern internet. Um, you know, imagine a world in which every meme, every photo, every tweet, every user review, every user rating, even every online dating profile, you know, all of that's user generated content. If the, uh, the website or the app that was hosting that content were considered the speaker of that content, it just would not really be workable in any meaningful way. And then conversely, imagine a world in which a website that wanted to delete or moderate a hateful con a comment or enforce a code of, uh, code of conduct um, faced liability for doing so. And so, in short, CDA 230 enables the best of the internet and you know, all the content that we're uh, about to talk about. Uh, this is hopefully the last time I'm going to say the word Section 230. But uh, if you're interested in hearing a little bit more, there's a bunch of IA staffers in the audience who'd be happy to talk to you about it during the happy hour. I'm also happy to talk to you about it. Um, there's some information in the folders that y'all have. Um, so with that, let's talk about our panelists here. So uh, it might not seem like, you know, uh, the, the founder of a local news site, uh, an, an Instagram photographer, and an eBay seller would have a ton in common, but there's three sort of key threads that tie everyone together and that I, I think are going to be the most important part of this conversation. So first, uh, everyone on the stage is, is a local DC or DMV re resident. You know, we're all here and we're all doing, um, you know, or all three of them are, you know, creating content and doing work centered around things that are happening in DC and that are based in DC. Uh, secondly, you know, they're interacting with all of us. They're, they're all you know, creating content that's DC focused and also hearing from folks in the community about that content, whether it's a review or a tip or a comment on, a, on an Instagram post. Um, and finally, and most importantly, they're you know, building a community online and that community is also translating into the offline world as well. Um, and you know, all of that is happening you know, thanks to the internet. So that's my spiel. That's hopefully the longest you'll hear me talk this whole time. Um, and so let's let's introduce our three panelists. First, we have Dan, the Prince of Petworth, the founder of Popville. He's been running the site since November of 2006 uh, and uh, surfacing local DC news and happenings. We have uh, Lori, who's the photographer behind DC City Girl, perhaps one of the best known, uh, biggest DC Instagram handles. And finally, we have Yinka, who runs the very successful Fashionably Legal, which is an eBay marketplace focusing specifically on apparel. So um, to kick things off, I sort of want to hear everyone's origin story, if you will. So, you know, Dan, you know, today you describe Popville as the like unofficial ombudsman for DC. I'm assuming it didn't really start that way. And so how did, how did it get started? Uh, well, I got out of the Navy and I went, no, I'm just kidding. Alan, I was like, <laughs> I moved to Petworth in the end of 2002, beginning of 2003, and there was a lot of talk about what's happening, what's coming in the future, what's going on. But at that time, nobody was talking about anything. Nobody was talking about anything. So there was nothing you know, in November that I said, OK, let's do it. But I just decided there was free software available. I said, all right, let me just try to do this. And if it's fun, it's fun. If it's not, it's not. And the idea originally was to just focus on Petworth itself. Because so in 2006, again, it, it's funny to talk about today. Because back then, when I told people that I lived in Petworth, they were like, what? Where? Not, not you're crazy that you live in Petworth, but they had literally never heard of Petworth. So anyway, the metro was built. It was a few years old now. And so, you know, this is going to get built. This is coming. And I said, all right, I'm going to start talking about it because the only time you heard about it was when there was crime, unfortunately, even though I still cover crime. But 
Um, so I said, screw it. So I just started talking about it. And then I walk everywhere. So it quickly went from Petworth to Columbia Heights to U Street, places where I hung out. And that was really it. And it just sort of resonated pretty quickly because not that many people were doing it. It sort of just filled this void pretty quickly. And so when did you know that like Popville was like a was like a thing that was no longer just you sort of talking about Petworth and people sort of knew where Petworth was in the world? That's a tough question. I mean, every, people write me and they say, you know, well, I want to start this and I want to do this and how did you do this and how did you do this? The fact of the matter is it's a very slow, organic, you know, I never, people say, you know, did you build a, uh, a business plan and this, that, and the other? Like, no, like, I didn't do any of this. There was no strategy, no, no plan, no anything. And so it was like, you know, you see people reading and you're like, okay, you know, the people talk about it. And then, you know, 2007, 2008, I think it was when Obama was elected. And just, there was this excitement. And I mean, then, then for sure, I knew. But in between 2006 and 2008, it's like, I think people like it, but I don't know, but I don't care. <laughs> you know, because like, yep. it wasn't my job, it was just for fun. Gotcha. All right. Well, I definitely want to hear more about that. Uh, but first, so Lori, you know, on your site, you say that part of your goal in the DC City Girl Instagram handle is to show people parts of DC that aren't, uh, that, that, you know, you wouldn't find on a travel site. So, you know, what weren't you seeing on travel sites and what is it that you wanted to highlight and why did you get DC City Girl started? Well, I think that um, travel sites are like, like um, trip advisors and those kind of things are still in the back ages. Um, they only want you to come to DC to see the monuments and stay in these particular hotels and you know they may throw out a few restaurants here and there but you know I think it's it's sort of a bland a very bland um, approach to travel in my city so um, being DC City Girl um, I get tagged on a lot of things anyway because I think I'm a feature site um, but I thought you know, I want to portray my city through my perspective and um, not, I don't want to see my pictures like in a travel brochure. I want to see pictures that are outside that travel brochure. Awesome. And, and so, you know, what, what made you get started on Instagram, you know, in the first place? I feel like I remember you were, you started shooting with like your iPhone 4, if I remember yeah, correctly. that's true. Um, so I started on Instagram eight years ago and um, I had my iPhone. And um, when I first joined it, I'm a systems engineer by trade, so I'm very technical, very analytical, and, and Instagram was an application that I was quite interested in, so I signed up, um, and I just uploaded a couple pictures, I think, from Greece, and, um, and then I realized that 32 people followed me. I was like, oh my God, 32 people follow me, you know, because I want to see my pictures from Greece. Well, I really like this. So, um, you know, I started um, actually looking at pictures on Instagram more than I cared about my own account because I love looking at pictures. I mean, they're just so amazing and people are so talented out there. So, um, and after my 32 followers, I thought I had to step up my game. So um, I did have my iPhone 4, and um, I had an Olo Clip macro lens. Um, I thought that macro photography was a thing to be, where to be. Um, I started taking pictures of flowers and bugs and um, bee butts and bee sex, a lot of, and a lot of insect sex. <laughs> And, um, and with my macro lens, I mean, it showed everything. And so um, that's where I started. And, and um, I eventually got kind of burned out with that, but um, that's where I, my first approach. Why I was on there, I had no clue. <laughs> you know, I had no clue why I was on Instagram, but it just seemed to work. That's, that's a question I ask myself every day, so. <laughs> Uh, so, so Yinka, you're you're like a practicing lawyer in DC. How did you start like and then grow a really successful, you know, eBay eBay business? 
Yeah, so uh, with eBay, eBay and I go back a long way. I, I remember the days uh, when I first started just as a buyer on eBay. I was really into sneakers. I remember opening my account junior year of high school, and we're talking back when you had to mail in a money order for payment for an item, and then the shoes would come. Um, so this was before credit cards, before PayPal and the whole deal. And, and so I've been familiar with the platform, but what grew from that is uh, I just had, there was a lot of things in the house. There was a lot of things in my mom's house. She was like, I helped me get rid of some of these items. And so I was like, oh, let's throw it up on eBay and see what happens. And then from there, it just grew organically. Um, as mentioned up here, there was no business plan. Okay, this is how I'm gonna start growing this business. Um, it just kind of grew organically, as I mentioned. And I was sitting, I remember sitting in bar exam study class and the name Fashionably Legal just popped into my head. <laughs> and so I didn't know what I was gonna do with it or where it was gonna go. Uh, and so this is what it spawned into and this is where we are. Gotcha, and are you, are you, I'm assuming you've run out of things to sell out of your grandmother's house? Or are you, what, what do you? Yes, yes, so <laughs> I, as I mentioned, I was really into sneakers, but I never sold sneakers on eBay when I first started. I, I really started taking eBay seriously right after law school. So I was really into suits and neckties and things of that nature. And this doubles back to the pictures. I, I was familiar with the site, The Sartorialist, on the internet, and I just loved the pictures that he took of just style and fashion and things of that nature, uh, style for him as well, and I was just interested in it. And so just getting the knowledge of those brands, what people like, that's how I got started, selling a lot of Tom Ford neckties. That, that was my bread and butter <laughs> when I first started. But then circling back, because of the internet, learning more, uh, I've been able to get back into the sneakers, which is, uh, I didn't realize sneakers were still a big deal even after high school. And so that's really been a boon for my business. That's, all right, well, that's awesome. So the, the first sort of broad topic I wanted to talk about was uh, community and how there's like a real, you know, all three of you are like building and interacting with like broader communities, both online and offline. Um, and so, you know, starting with you, Yinka, I think it might surprise folks to hear that there's like a really robust eBay, you know, seller community and also a buyer community. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yes, that? Uh, the, the community on eBay has been uh, tremendous. In the past three years, I've been able to go to eBay Open, which is eBay's annual seller conference uh, that happens at the end of July. And it's just been an opportunity to just meet like-minded sellers, people who are super successful, million dollar sellers, small time sellers, just gaining the knowledge from them uh, how they were able to grow their business. And just being more involved uh, with eBay in general. I didn't want to be just another seller, an anonymous seller. So that's what led me to get involved with eBay's Main Street, which is their government relations office, uh, where I was able to connect with them and participate in their uh, DC fly-in, which is an advocacy day where we meet with local members of Congress and uh, talk about issues that affect small businesses like uh, the internet sales tax in the past year. So just being able to connect with both buyers and sellers in that way has just been great. Awesome, and so, you know, Lori, I think you're part of like a slightly different kind of community on Instagram. Uh, and it's really grown into like something really cool. So do you want to maybe talk about like IGDC and how that all got started? Sure. Um, so on my early days in, on Instagram, I went to um, meetup.com and I found that there was this, you know, meeting on, at Bar Pilar on 14th Street um, for like-minded Instagrammers from DC. So I'm like, okay, cool, I'm gonna go there. And my, my daughter said, mom, be careful, you don't know these people, text me when you get there. You know, like it had the whole parental reversal role. Um, so I got there and there were about 15 of us and um, we're all drinking beer and, you know, talking about Instagram and, you know, should we have, you know, an Insta group here? I mean, I don't even think Insta meet was quite the word yet. And um, we're like, yeah, sure, you know, well, do you think we need an Instagram presence, you know, the IGDC? We, we all went around the table and we decided it was going to be IGDC. Well, who's going to do it? And I'm like, not me. And um, so Holly Gardner um, stepped forward and, and um, she's our queen who created the account and everything. And I curate as, as well um, as um, Austin Graff also curates. And, um, so we created it, and we had our first Insta meet like in October. Um, I believe we went to the Wonder Bread factory when it wasn't even, I mean, it was still shut down and closed and all rusty. 
And Rusty was really important because I'm like looking for bugs and um, <laughs> flowers, and it's October, and I've and all these other people are looking like taking all the you know pictures of the buildings and architecture and everything. Like, well, what am I going to do? You know. So um, I I think I did rust. I did a lot of rust that day, which is very colorful. Um, but I realized then that I really had to, you know, step up my game again and start looking up rather than than macroing. Um, but that became um, a group of people that um, we ended up growing very close to each other. Um, it used that first day. It used to be, "Hi, I'm DC City Girl," or you know, and "Hi, I'm so and so." It was never, "Hi, I'm Lori," you know, or "Hi, I'm Lori, I'm DC City Girl." It was always, "Hi, I'm DC City Girl," because we only knew each other from our names on Instagram. Um, eventually, after the time had gone by, um, we had become closer friends than, and I'll give you an example. Um, one of the Instagrammers' mothers died. We were all there at the funeral. Um, two of the people in our group got married. You know, a couple of them started living together. Um, I went to the Outer Banks this last weekend, Labor Day weekend. Nine of us were there. All met on Instagram. <laughs> so. Um, they are some of my closest, dearest friends in the whole world, and part of my everyday life. Yeah, that's incredible, and like the, it's like that's really the opposite story, right? It's like I met these people online, and now we're best friends for life. It's usually that's that's so cool. Uh, and so, you know, Dan, I, I, um, we we joked in the office. This is slightly different talk. We joked in the office that like Popville has a very robust comment section, this lively debate. I think Allah even said like I bet there's been a bunch of relationships that have been found, you know, started in the Popville comment section. I don't. Can you confirm or can you confirm that yes, that is in fact? There has been a wedding as well. Really? Yes. That's that's incredible. Wow. <laughs> but the the community you can look at it in many many different ways. There are like 50 different types of community. There's the sort of very basic, like, I just want to know what's going on in the city. But not everybody really cares that passionately, but that's the basis, okay? So you have that community. But then you have people who are super invested, and I'm talking about, so there's a post that goes up every morning that's called Rant or Revel, and the range of subjects that's spoken about <laughs> is very intense. I mean, it's like very personal, you know, miscarriages, parents dying, you know, very heavy stuff that people might not feel comfortable talking in person, but actually have sort of found this online sort of support system. And then you have, you know, people that meet in person through happy hours or, or whatever. And then there's like 50 other million communities. So it's like, you know, depending on where you're at out there, you can get whatever you want. If you want super intense face-to-face, -face, that exists. If you just want, you know, I just want to know that you know what's going on in Parkview. Like, am I losing my mind or is this happening? <laughs> okay, I got my people here. I mean, there, you know, it really is divided in a million different ways. So it's tough for me to talk about community because, you know, there's some jack wagons too. So it's, you know, it's like, it's not all rainbows and roses. You know, there's, it's like life. You know, it's, it's, it's a real community, <laughs> good people and bad people. Yeah. And, and was, um, was that community part of like your original vision for, for Popville? No. no. <laughs> no. Well, again, there was no original fair, vision. Fair. But so, so when, like, when did you introduce a comment section? And did, how, did it, how did it like change? There the, was always a comment was, section okay. because, so I'm known in some circles for walking a lot and, and you know, getting a lot of information that way. But, the fact became known to me very quickly that you get far more information from people sending it to you than you. I mean, today it's really a combination. It's me, it's, it's people sending it in, but it's, it's probably 75% people sending stuff to me. Huh. And so, you know, then I figured very quickly, all right, I'm not going to be able to answer all these questions. I, I don't know what the hell. Like, I don't know anything. Like, I, I worked at a defense consulting firm. Like, <laughs> I'm not an expert. And, 
any of these urban planning, transit, crime, whatever. Um, but you know, any question that somebody asks is answered because the community, the greater community, the greater popular community is huge. And there is not a question that is asked that cannot be answered. I mean, I don't think there has ever been a question that has been stumped. What is the most obscure question that uh, that's ever been answered? I mean, there's a, there, you can't, you can't even begin. But I can tell you the from mind today, boggles. I can tell you from today. Somebody wrote, they said, they saw it, they sent this picture of this guy who's riding a bicycle and he has a dog and a, and a carrier behind the bicycle going in. And she says, I'm obsessed with this guy, who is he? In two hours, he says, I'm Jim. This is my IG handle. I live in Columbia Heights. I go to the 11th and Bark Park, and I'm moving to Noma. That's within two hours. So it's like, That's incredible. And, and that, that is, I mean, there are far crazier uh, examples, like tougher questions. Like, sure. you know, I saw this, this penny, and it was bent and dented, and it looked like a 1974, and this, that, oh. Well, that's a rare, you know, quadri <laughs> penny. You know, blah, blah. Like, there is not a question that can't be answered. That's that's uh, incredible, and I think I need to spend some more time in the comment section with just. I'm, I'm going to find the question that no one but, can answer. But, but you shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. People, people conflate the the site with the comment section, and and the comment section works for some people, but the overall success of the site is not based on the comment section at all. Like any comment section, you know, in 2019, there's, you know, bananas people, and there's good people, and there's trolls, and there's this. So if you focus too much on comments, you're crazy. <laughs> you're going to lose your mind. But again, in 2019, you don't just have the site itself. You have Instagram. You have Twitter. You have Facebook. You have, I mean, everything. So that, again, the community is better identified from who you are, but you don't get the best out of it through the comments. Although for some people you do. That's what well, so I was going to say, you know, Lori, you probably have a little bit different of a take because I feel like your comment section might be a little bit less uh, uh, large maybe if that makes sense and a little bit like a little bit more tailored to what it is that you're yeah, I mean, I do get a, a few hundred comments per picture and depending on what it is, it's like um, you know, if I'm if it's an event of some sort, they want more information about it. They want to know where it is, how long it's open. Um, you know, I'll geotag everything, but they'll say, you know, where is it? And I'm like, it's geotagged. <laughs> and um, but um, it's a it's a back and forth conversation. And I, even when the pop up bar, um, like the Christmas pop up bar, came up. Um, I, my feed was, my comment section was filled with other people tagging other people, let's go, let's go, let's go, we have to go here, we, you know, blah, blah, blah. So sometimes there's a lot of conversation amongst themselves and have nothing to do with me. Um, but yeah, I think the, the craziest, most memorable um, comments that I think I've had that are now almost, almost normal um, is, that's me in the picture. <laughs> And, um, or I live in that house. Um, even in my stories, I do a lot of stories, and um, I, I can remember that I was at the, um, the the Capitals parade, and I think I put my phone up in the air and, and was getting the people behind me, and um, from walking down Penn Avenue, and somebody said, that's me, and that's my dad. You know? <laughs> so I, I think that to me is just amazing. Um, I've done a stride by, there was a girl striding by um, Logan Circle one day in front of Grant's house, and I took her picture, and she said, that's me. And I said, do you want the picture? You know, because, um, you know, why not? But yeah, I love that. I love, I've been invited to parties from, um, that's my house, do you, I'll invite you next time we have a party. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. That's, that's awesome. Uh, no, no marriage proposals that you know of, but... Not to me. <laughs> I used to do a house of the day, similarly, like, which is architecture, and then it would, if they were renting a room, it would be on, on uh, Craigslist. 
as featured in pop film. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I just thought it was a cool looking house. Well, interestingly, you should say that because a lot of real estate people take my pictures and repost okay, them, and I just right. have to go after them. I mean, I you know, honestly don't mind anybody reposting my pictures as long as they give me credit. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I prefer it to be tagged as well because my feed is only like 15 minutes long. And so if you don't tag me, it goes right by me, and I never see it. If you mention me in the caption, you know. It when just, you call them out on it, they, they're, oh, yeah. they're, they're receptive, though. And I will tell you, I called someone out today, and um, it wasn't my picture. <laughs> they, um, <laughs> they, um, <laughs> it was the same picture. I, oh, I'm sorry. I keep touching this mic. Testing. Um, I, this guy, real estate guy, who always reposts my picture, and he tags me. But he didn't give me credit in the caption. I thought, that's really weird. So I DM'd him and I said, you know, I, I, don't, I don't mind you reposting my pictures. I said, but um, I do mind you if you don't say credit in the caption. He says, that's my picture. I took it this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and I sent, him this, <laughs> I sent him my version of it, which is pretty identical. Um, but, you know, fair enough. It was his picture. <laughs> All right, well, lesson, lesson learned. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Uh, so, so uh, Yinka, on, you're sort of on like a, in a slightly different way. You you also very much care about like user comments. And if I'm not mistaken, you have like the magical 100% rating on eBay, which we were joking in the office. Like, how how do you do that? So, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So, feedback rating on eBay is vital to any success that you have on the website because at the end of the day, you're just another person, and so they need to see that trail of successful transactions in order to feel comfortable purchasing from you, just as if they would purchase from any um, retail store. And so uh, I really pay close attention to who I'm selling to and also just to provide that class of service that they're looking for. So I try and do the one day handling. Um, I try and ship as fast as possible. I always put in that thank you note for them so that they just uh, feel that personalized uh, success of a transaction. And so. Um, yeah, it's, it's vital to just connect with buyers. And as we mentioned in the room, sometimes you have some uh, difficult buyers. Uh, another story, there, I had a buyer, she bought some St. Laurent heels. And she lived in Australia, uh, which is another great far-reaching aspect of eBay that you can sell anywhere in the world. Well, she decided to argue with me on the sizing. So I put the US sizing and I put a European conversion. Well, her conversion was different. So we had a little back and forth. I even sent her to the St. Laurent website to show that I was correct, but it just wasn't enough for her. She just wasn't having it. And so she insisted on sending the shoes back. And it was looking like it was going to lead to a, that negative feedback. But at the end of the day, I, I just said, look, we'll, we'll make it right. And I'll take the shoes back. You get your money back and, and move forward. So just being able to connect with buyers in that way, make it more of a personal experience uh, definitely helps. Yeah, that's both sides. no. That that makes that makes perfect sense. And you know, back uh, before the panel, you also mentioned someone claimed that you'd sent them two right shoes. <laughs> I mean, that's just impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I got that message. I was like, that's just it's virtually impossible. There's no way I have two of the right shoe in the box because it was a brand new shoe because I sell mostly new items. And so it's like I don't know where you got that picture from or how it happened, but hey. Keep the shoe. I'll, <laughs> it wasn't that expensive of a shoe. Yeah. It's like, just keep the shoe and uh, we'll just move forward. So you never really know what you're going to get back, but it's a, a matter of just choosing your battles and seeing uh, what works for both people in, in order to meet that uh, happy medium. Gotcha. That, that, make, that makes sense. And yeah. you know, it's, it's cool that you at least get to, I mean, you at least get to hear from someone when they're claiming, you know, you sent me two right shoes. But yes. <laughs> that's, you at least have the opportunity to have the conversation. For sure. Yeah. Uh, so you know, another thing I wanted to talk about is like, uh, it, that was a lot of not words. Uh, it's really interesting how on the internet you at least you at least get feedback, and not just in terms of comments, but in terms of like you can measure like how successful was this post or what was the rating on this. So um, you know I, I know there's some some differing views about you know how to use that information. So maybe Lori, starting with you, you know how do you think about the like the information you get say from Instagram or elsewhere and and you know whether or not it's how actionable is it to you? How much does it affect you know what you're doing? Are you very much catering to people? Or are you saying I'm just going to keep doing my own thing? You know how do you think about that? I have a little bit of both of that. Um, my analytics when when analytics first came out, I started looking at them. I don't I'm not obsessed with them whatsoever, um, but I had about 50 50 
men versus women following my account. And I think that was more um, of my street photography, because after I went macro, I started looking up. I was doing street photography. I was climbing on roofs. I was going out with the guys, carrying my tripod off over my shoulder, and um, you know, doing that kind of lens ball, um, everything. And um, I had more guys following me. Um, again, I kind of moved on. I kind of got burned out a little bit. And um, I decided to do a lot of architecture, which is what I'm in now. My analytics now say that 72% um, of the people who follow me are women. So um, I don't want to say that I'm stuck in that niche, because um, you know that is what it, that's what it is today. So um, I'm going to stick with it. I love doing what I'm doing. Um, I know some of the guys left me, but it's okay. <laughs> um, I'll try to get them back. Okay. Uh, but I, I yeah. still follow you. For, yeah. for what it's <laughs> thanks, <like>. thanks. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> you? I do. <laughs> no, but seriously, so it, it, it does matter to me in some respects. In some respects, it doesn't because, you know, I can't please everybody. I just can't. And, and I will tell you, um, and I've had this conversation before when I've sp spoke at other events, is that I like my own pictures. I mean, and I do. I like, I hit the like button. <laughs> and I do that for myself um, to put that picture up there, and whether it flops or, you know, it, it goes great or it goes bad, I always like it because I wouldn't have put it up there if I didn't. So I think that's a goal, good rule of thumb. I haven't archived anything. Um, I've deleted pictures, like, way back, a lot of my macro early on, so I've kind of deleted the very bottom of my feed. Um, in the old days, you couldn't get down to the bottom of your feed anyway. Instagram wouldn't let you scroll that far. But um, yeah, so I like my pictures. <laughs> that's, I mean, that, you know, that's, that's, that's definitely like the, the minimum, like that's, it's got to meet that threshold to, to sort of like get on, the, get on Instagram. That makes perfect sense. Um, and so, Dan, I know, you know, we were talking uh, earlier in the week and you said like, you know that, you know, 95% of uh, uh, Popville, uh, like readers and followers, or like DC locals or DMV locals, and you have some pretty good information about like what posts are and aren't successful. But you had a slightly different take about sort of what you know how how you think about what you're putting on the site every day. Do you want to share that? Uh, for for me, the analytics is just out of curiosity because the threshold for what I post almost sounds similar. Yeah. Is that it's is it of interest to me? I mean, that's what I've always decided. Now. When I post things, I know pretty much at this point what's going to be super popular and what's not going to be. But I still post, for example, the garden halls. Like most people don't give a shit about how many, you know, cucumbers you brought in. But still, every <laughs> night <laughs> I post because it's just like good for you. It's yeah. like it's impressive to me. Um, and and there's other stuff like that, like a lot of historical stuff I find fascinating. But people could care less. The, the masses could care less. And so I, you know, I can see it, but it doesn't mean I, I don't post it. And then you know, if you have something you know, exceptional or, or controversial, or, yeah, of course, you're going to have a lot more people. But it doesn't change um, you know, what I do and what I don't do. Gotcha. What, what would you say is like the, the most thing that you are just posting for you? For me, yeah. I, I mean, I love architecture and, and history yeah. and maps, stuff like that. People could care less. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel, I feel like the DC crowd, like there's, there's, a, there's an it's audience not, for I it. mean, it depends the numbers that you're talking about. I mean, when we're, when we're talking about hundreds of thousands, OK, so if a 1,000 people like it, that's a, pff, it's a blip. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not really you know, the, the, the greater um, audience. Gotcha. And so uh, the, the last uh, question that I wanted to ask before we open it up to questions, um, and you know, Laurie, it actually touches up really well on what, what you just said is that you know, everything you put up, like you like it, and that's why you like it. And you know, what's, you know, for, for all three of you, um, like the, the content that you're putting out there, it's like it, it's your brand. It's what you've decided to sort of like put out into the world. And there's no like filter or context between you and everyone who's consuming it. And so you know, I'd just be curious your thoughts about you know, like how you think about 
how you think about what you're putting up in, in, in sort of like a broader sense and you know, why, why, you're, why you're doing it. So, you know, Lori, I don't know if you want to start. Um, well, I always put up what I like. And um, I mean, I don't, sometimes there is no rhyme or reason. I think sometimes I do kind of figure out what I'm going to do. Um, some people take a look at their grid and the lines have to show up. It has to be dark, light, dark. I mean, there's some pattern to it or whatever. I don't do that. I just have fun with it and put whatever I want up. Um, there might be a last minute that I'm looking through my old pictures and I'm like, oh, well, I, I'm going to put that up. So, you know, nobody is helping me f to figure that out. Um, I'm just doing it and, you know, let it fly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and so, you know, Yinka, obviously, like, you're selecting everything that's going up on, going up on your site. So how do, you, how do you think about that? I think about it in terms of just trying to gain the knowledge of what people want to buy, what, what's trending and, and things of that nature. So I started in menswear because that was something I was passionate about and knowledgeable about. But I learned that women will always shop more than men. Like, it's just, it's just fact. And so that was just an, a genre that I needed to learn. Um, as you know, in retail, if you're not willing to adapt and change, you get left behind. And so with that, I decided to just learn more about women's clothing and things of that nature, accessories. And in so doing, going on Instagram, going on other internet websites, uh, seeing successful sellers in those other areas and just learning from them. I know even um, one, the Hustler Hacks, Hustle at Home Mom, people like that, I just would just devour all of their content as far as on Instagram and YouTube, and that's how I just gained the knowledge and became more comfortable in knowing I can buy this and that this will sell. And so that's just been very helpful for me. I should, all right, same, same question to you, Dan. And I, yeah. Uh, probably is it either interesting or useful? A lot of people you know, criticize me for some of the questions because a lot of Again, the content is user submitted, user generated. You know, why do you put such a silly question up? Why do you put such, you know, obviously it's this and that. It's not obvious. Not everybody knows. So if I think that it's going to benefit some people, okay, yeah. So even if I know the answer, I put it up there. Why? Who cares? Uh, all right. Well, Thank you, thank you guys so much. Uh, we've got a couple minutes for questions. I know, Dan, you've got a hard stop at 430, but uh, I think we should have a microphone um, right over there if anyone has any questions. Can you just project loudly? Uh, <laughs> sure. How do you manage uh, your content from knowing what you've posted in the past? And it seems like you've all had a long history online. Do you worry about linking to the past? Or I know Dan, you frequently ask the question, like, what are the best tacos in town? Mm. And it's always a really engaging conversation. Uh. How do you do that? And like, with all of the clothes that you're selling, do you worry about reselling things you've previously sold online? Or, Lori, do you worry about this posting the same picture? I mean, I worry about posting the same outfit twice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, there's pressure. How do y'all do that? Do you it's, worry about that? It's a, it is a great question, and I do care. And it, it again goes to, is it useful? If somebody asks, what are the best tacos last week? And then two weeks from today, I get a question, what are the best tacos? I'll just send them the link to that. But if it's two years, if it's four years, if it's three, so coming on 13 years now, I mean, I've there's nothing I haven't covered, basically. <laughs> um, there are always new people coming. There were people that were 10 years old 13 years ago. And now they care about what bars to go to. You know? So it's like, again, is it useful? But I do think about, you know, have we covered it before? And then trying to link to the old one at times. Um, but again, also in DC, you know, things are opening and closing all the time. And so it's like, it is very beneficial to refresh um, these things. But again, you can't make it up. But if it's a genuine question that somebody's sending in that's saying, hey, I want to know this, they say, if that person wants to know it, even though we talked about it a year ago, six months ago, then I guarantee you other people want to know it too. I actually um, post a few things, duplicates at times. Like, for example, if it's the sunflowers, you know, when sunflower seasons come up, if, if they're going to be blooming next week, 
and I know that, and I want to get the word out to people, I'll take a last year's picture. Um, I try not to take the one I posted last year, but one in the, you know, I might have taken 50 pictures, so I may have taken one different one, but sometimes I do take the same one, it's just easier. And I might say, this is from last year, you know, or, you know, this is a, this was, last, you know, I always try to say it was last year, um, just so they know it's not right now, because people get really freaked out, and they're like, how long is it going to last, you know? So, like, and I'll give you an example. Of the, um, I keep my eye on the sunflowers in Baltimore. So they're going to bloom at the end of this month. So probably in a couple weeks, maybe, you know, maybe four days before they're really, like, ready to go, I might pull, pull a picture from my, you know, files and my archives and say, you know, these... These are blooming now, and this is where to get, you know, how to get there and everything. So, yeah, you know, I try not to, but it, I, I think there's a purpose behind it, if I do. I think with everything, there has to be a system. Um, as my business has grown, there's just been more and more items, and it's, it's been harder. I, I sometimes break out in cold sweats if I sell something and I can't find it immediately. It's like, ah, did I already sell this? But just taking because I like to turn things over in one day handling time so just uh, trying to come up with a system to make sure that I haven't sold it to be able to locate the items because I've been running this business by myself now my, my wife helps along with it and um, so just doing that just finding a system of a way to find the items and just to keep the inventory coming in so once the inventory comes in I like to list it within a day uh, they call it a death pile you don't want to get a death pile, whereas items that you've sourced but aren't listed, because you can't sell what you, you don't list. And so just that system of getting it listed right away so that nothing builds up where I it's like have the question of, did I list this already or not? So if I can just continue to be consistent in listing items as soon as I get them, that definitely helps out with um, not having that overlap. All right, great. Uh, any other questions from the audience? I have, I have more questions, so uh, sure. A little more for Dan than the others because he's managing user-generated content in the form of a comments section, but how do you deal with unwanted comments, with unwanted user-generated content? What does your either set of policies or then uh, actions workflow look like around that? It has turned all my hair gray. <laughs> that is probably the most difficult thing I deal with day to day is because you want to have a, as, as much an open world as possible. But the fact of the matter is what I concluded very early on, you know, within a year or two, is that if people are assholes, people don't want to hang around assholes. So you have to figure out a balance of how do you let in honest and true thought and opinion versus you know just people irritating each other and unfortunately there is no system to to solve that and so again i decided very early on that's on me i'm just going to do it this is why yeah, like the city people will write articles. Why do people hate Dan? You know, well, they hate me because I'll just, I do what I got to do, and I don't care. Because if I didn't do what I had to do, nobody would read the site. Believe me. Some of the shit that I have to excise, it's all me. It is all me. And so do I make mistakes? Of course. I mean, are there times that I've, deleted comments that I probably shouldn't have? Of course. But at the end of the day, I got to create this, this world that exists that's going to be a useful place. And again, that's the benefit of being one person, is that I don't have to run it up a chain and do this, that, and the other. But it sucks. I mean, it is, it's really difficult. And you know, sometimes you think people are just being provocative when they're genuine and vice versa. And so it's, it's hard to, to make it work. But you know, at the end of the day, you just got to make the decision and stick with it and move on. All right, great. Uh, I think I saw one other question, and maybe? Yeah, yeah. I had um, just a question. It seems like uh, it 
seems like you are all early adopters uh, of your chosen platforms. So I was just wondering kind of how changes in technology have impacted what you've been doing over the last several years. Um, and uh, if there's anything you're particularly anticipating coming down the pike. Well, that's a great question. I'm gonna answer first, cause then I'm gonna leave. <laughs> then they can talk as long as they want. I only started using Instagram like a year ago. And all these people are like, what are you doing? Why aren't you using Instagram? I'm like, why the hell do I have to use Instagram? And this, I've had that same exact conversation for every platform, for Twitter. Why, now I have a huge Twitter presence. Before, people said, why aren't you on Twitter? I'm like, why do I have to be on Twitter? I, I have the site. <laughs> people can go to the site if they want it. So now, I've sort of appreciated how important all of the platforms are. And I mean, it's a little, we're all in these different worlds. Yeah. Strictly from my perspective, I need to be on almost every platform that exists because the audience comes, before, when you first started, everybody came to the site straight away. Now, everybody comes to you in their preferred platform. And if you ignore one platform, that's at your own peril. And it's a terrific question as to be, you know, what are we looking for in the future? Like, I'm gonna be 45. Like, I don't know shit. Like, I don't know what's cool, what's new, what's happening. So it's like, I count on people to tell me, okay, just like they did with Twitter. And like, there are so many people who know so much more than I do that they will tell me, okay, you know, TikTok or, or, or Snapchat or whatever the next thing like that, like you gotta get on it. And I'm gonna be like, why? And I'll be like, fine, <laughs> and then I'll do it, and then I'll get on it. But thank you very much, and sorry right. to leave you thank guys. You. Bye, Dan. <laughs> so I use, um, well, I'm sort of just the opposite. I hardly have any followers on Twitter. And, um, and plus I can't, couldn't get DC City Girl, and it's, um, I have DC City Girl underscore. And the person that has DC City Girl is like a dead account, dorm, dead nine-year-old dead account that I can't seem to get Twitter to give me. And um, so my Twitter account is, I, I play a little differently, because if I had uploaded everything that I put on Instagram, I don't think, I mean, I, I don't think anybody's really interested. They're more interested in sunsets, sunrises, and you know, those kind of things. They're not, I mean, a house is not gonna be intriguing to them and my followers. Um, I also do use Pinterest, and I use, um, I have DC City Girl Photography on Facebook, and, and I think Facebook was the first other um, thing that I used for DC City Girl. And, um, and then with, with Pinterest, um, and Facebook, um, I have this app that just uploads my stuff because it's a lot of work. You know, I think it's a lot of work. And I mean, I, I'm so wrapped around Instagram that I just can't, it's hard. So um, I also have um, dccitygirl.com um, and that's fairly new. And it was just all my pictures, again, are being regurgitated up there, but then I started doing a blog. And um, I thought that because so many people ask me so much about the city, they're coming here for four days, I'm bringing my kid for its 16th birthday, you know, it's like I'm the travel agent and I try to, you know, where can I take them for dinner? And I used to worry about, well, um, you know, how much can you afford? I mean, so now I just say, oh, what my favorites are. You know, I, I don't care if they can't afford it or not. I'm just telling them what I think, you know, la, la diplomat you know, or um, Alfacino is my, one of my favorites now in DC Wharf, you know, I've been throwing that one out. But I, do, you know, and then I have my planned um, galleries that I love. I mean, I love the Hirshhorn, I love National Gallery East, but not the West, I like the East. <laughs> and, um, and there are reasons. So, so I mean, it's, it's a lot of work. For me, uh, just technology in general, like Dan, I was a, new subscriber to Instagram probably within the last year and a half and just getting on there every day, seeing what people post, um, the type of items that I sell, there are a lot of sellers who will post their finds like, I found this, 
this is a good seller. So it's just something that I see it as almost as if reading a newspaper for me. So that's the way I've seen technology grow. I use that to see what I should be sourcing and just to learn more about these sellers. Like when I went to the eBay Open Conference three years ago, I didn't know any of these big YouTube and Instagram followers. They were like, oh, did you see Rally Roots? I'm like, what's a rally and what's a root? <laughs> like, I didn't, I didn't know who these people were and little did I know that they were big time eBay sellers and just growing over the next couple years on Instagram, on eBay in general, helped me to famili familiarize myself with these people and just, I can call some of these people friends and just like get their personal contact information and um, just bounce ideas off of their heads about what should I be doing to grow my business? And kind of like she said, you, you see these people as friends and even like family. Um, so I'm able to contact them. I thought it was really great how she mentioned that uh, her internet friends, they were able to go to that funeral. And I, I just see personal relationships like that growing on Instagram. And you couldn't imagine things like this happening just a few years ago. So definitely internet and technology advancement has played a huge role. All right. I could not think of a better note to end on than that. <laughs> so uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. We have a happy hour up on the roof uh, starting, I think, right now. Uh, there is one elevator, so you'll, th there might be a, a line that, that might form, so apologies. But uh, two, el well, yeah, but you got to, not, not from our floor. All right. There's two elevators, sorry. Uh, and uh, we look forward to all of you uh, joining us for the happy hour. And thank you so much for coming. And let's give a, a hand to our panel. <laughs>